Today, for the very first time in a very long time, we are witnessing what appears to be a serious conflict in this uh, coveted relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia. Let's do this. Let's, let's go to the map because I, I want to I try and set this scene for you So because I think this is one of those stories that if you can visualize it, you can better understand it. So we've told you about all the different incidents that have been taking place here in the Persian Gulf over the last several weeks, Ralph, how volatile this, uh, this region right here has become of late. It, it's almost like, think of it this way. It's like this area here is like a line of demarcation between two countries that hate each other's guts. They despise each other, right? So here's Saudi Arabia on this side of the Persian Gulf, right? Saudi Arabia, which needs the United States protection here in the Gulf, which it offers, which also needs United States protection here in Yemen, where it's fighting a war, right? Now let me show you the adversaries, the other side, right? Here's Iran, as you can see right there, which supports the factions in Yemen that are at war with Saudi Arabia. And also, what can we say about Iran? Well, they want dominion of this area of the Persian Gulf and are trying to establish it with its navy. So both Iran and Saudi Arabia, right? You have Iran and Saudi Arabia fighting for hegemony in this region. They both want to say, we're the boss, you know, we're, we're controlling this situation. But something, something happened last year, something that began uh, to alter this a little bit. And, and let me show you another map so we can capture what we're talking about here. Bring that in if you can, uh, Kevin. All right, here it is. It's these two dots essentially right here. See these two locations that are not far from Riyadh? Back last September of last year, there was a bold attack. I mean, they hit them hard. These are the uh, famous Aramco oil fields in Saudi Arabia. Uh, one of them occurred right here. This is called, and I'll try pronouncing it, but it's uh, Bukyuk, right here in this region. And the other one occurred here in the region known as Kurais. Those are two big, giant, major oil fields. They knocked out oil production for more than two weeks, shut them down. And there's reason to suspect that, you know, who was behind it? Iran. Right? Iran behind the attack. So what happened? Saudi Arabia turns to the United States after this incident and they say, please help us, United States. So the United States sent them several batteries of Patriot missiles and two jet fighter squadrons to uh, defend these particular oil fields. So guess what happened within the past week? The United States says to Saudi Arabia, sorry, Charlie, we're going to take those Patriot missiles and the fighter squadrons back. You're on your own. Because the Saudis were still producing and shipping out too much oil, causing the price of U.S. crude to tank, and all the businesses here were complaining to the White House. The White House picks up the phone. They threaten Saudi Arabia, essentially telling them, look, you either stop producing or you're going to lose the protection that we're giving you. And then the White House did it. It wasn't just a threat. President Trump pulled the protection. So now, guess what Saudi Arabia does? Guess what they've just done? They just announced that they're going to reduce their output of oil again by another one million barrels a day, right? So essentially, as I lay out this scenario for you, you have to ask yourself, who's the winner in all of this and who's the loser? Well, the winner in all of this, say, Middle East experts, is Iran interestingly enough, while they're also saying that for the first time in a long time, they're seeing the, 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 the Saudi veneer, if you will, showing signs of cracking. L let me uh, put up another sign that uh, kind of shows you what we're talking about. These are the signs that the Saudis are hurting, right? Um, oil demand down. Right? Nobody wants their oil because of COVID-19. That's tough for a country that's basically a one-trick pony economy, right? They're forced to cut their production, right? They say that they will now pay for their own defense, really? Uh, and Iran is not letting up, and now we add something else. We have learned that it's going to begin to tax its own people, as we see here in the bottom. The kingdom is actually increasing its VAT, or VAT, it's a value-added tax, which is what they call it there. We don't have it here. It's a tax on consumers and uh, businesses by a whopping 15%. That's a situation, something we haven't seen in a while. This is friction. This is pain. 
where there usually isn't any. Now, how does this change the Middle East dynamic? The uh, curious case of uh, Saudi Arabia for decades, it has flaunted its wealth on the world stage, oftentimes to the point of seeming almost repugnant about it. And with the exception of Iran, countries big and small all over the world have told Saudi Arabia, whatever you want, you can have. But COVID-19 and the circumstances we're seeing now globally may be changing that. Is it episodic? Is it long-term? We've expanded coverage on this story, and we're going to begin with RT correspondent John Huddy. Saudi Arabia, like the rest of the world, has been struggling with the coronavirus pandemic. The kingdom of 34 million people has more than 42,000 confirmed cases and close to 300 deaths, enough to hit the economy there hard as well. So much so, Riyadh is planning on tripling its VAT, the value-added tax on basic goods from 5% to 15% starting July 1st, while also suspending the cost of living allowance to its citizens starting June 1st. Saudi Arabia instituted the VAT two years ago as part of an overall plan to cut its reliance on the world's crude oil market. The cost of living allowance of 1,000 rials, or about 270 per month to state employees, started in 2018 to help offset the increased costs of the VAT and a rise in the price of petrol. Now, with revenues falling because of the coronavirus pandemic, the kingdom is looking to recoup the money lost. The country's finance minister, Mohammed al jadan said in a statement the measures are aimed at helping put public finances in a position to support the economy as it emerges from lockdown, adding, quote, these measures are painful but necessary to maintain financial and economic stability over the medium to long term and overcome the unprecedented coronavirus crisis with the least damage possible. The question is how much damage these measures will have. They're the most drastic action taken yet by a major Gulf oil producer since oil prices plunged more than half in March. The International Monetary Fund has projected that all six energy producing Gulf states and the Gulf Cooperation Council, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, United Arab Emirates and Oman will be in economic recession this year. And as the GCC states grapple with the financial outlook post pandemic, Saudi Arabia is also planning to cut its oil production by 1 million barrels starting June 1st to reportedly further help support the global oil markets. Kuwait and the UAE also plan additional cuts. Meantime, the United States is removing two Patriot missile batteries that had been guarding Saudi oil fields from Iranian attacks and what was reportedly the fallout from the dispute over the Saudi oil price war with Russia. Asked about the removal of the Patriot batteries, President Trump said this last week. Well, I don't want to talk about it, but we're doing some things. We're making a lot of moves in the Middle East and elsewhere. We're doing a lot of things all over the world militarily. We've been taken advantage of all over the world, our military, and uh, in the sense that we're, and this has nothing to do with Saudi Arabia, this has to do with other countries, frankly, much more. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said the Patriot missile battery withdrawal did not signal any decreasing support for Saudi Arabia, nor was it related to the ongoing oil dispute between Saudi Arabia and Russia. Pompeo said the U.S. still considers Iran a threat. It will likely be a topic of discussion when Secretary Pompeo meets with Israeli officials this week in Jerusalem, where he's also expected to discuss Israel's West Bank annexation plans and China's control of Israel's Haifa port. For the news with Rick Sanchez, John Huddy. Great stuff, John. Thanks for putting that together for us. So what do you do when all you got is oil? <laughs> Suddenly, nobody wants it. Joining us now are two perfect guests to discuss this uh, topic. Uh, former UK MP George Galloway and economist and noted professor Richard Wolf. Professor, I'm going to start with you. What do you make of this, uh, this uh, sticky wicket that suddenly the uh, Saudi Arabians uh, fi find themselves in? Well, the first thing I'd say is that anybody who continues to believe uh, Secretary of State Pompeo uh, really needs to clean their ears and uh, reopen their eyes uh, to understand. You had it right, Rick. Uh, this is a very important break in the relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia. They used to work together pretty well, pretty consistently, to make a lot of money for oil companies by moving the price up or down as needed. Now they've had a falling out. The United States, in the leadership of Mr. Trump, 
wants to make friends among the people doing the oil fracking and in the oil business in the middle of our country, from Canada in the north through Texas in the south. Hmm. To do that, he's got to get the price up. And to get the price up, the biggest producer of oil in the world is Saudi Arabia. We've had a, the, the COVID virus that lessens the demand, simple law of economics, cut the supply so far down that the price of oil goes up. That is what the people in the Midwest, the frackers, want, uh, and that's what the oil producers want. The fact that it'll hurt all of us with our heating oil and our gasoline and the fertilizer producers who use the oil, that comes later, that's after the election. The immediate job is what it is, and the authorities have to go along or else they get threatened in exactly the way you summarize. That's interesting, and I'm thinking, George, I wonder, uh, are the Iranians uh, smart enough to, knew, to, 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 to know this was coming and to kind of uh, almost, uh, in a Malkavalian fashion, set this whole thing up as some are charging? No, I think uh, they just sit back and uh, watch the special relationship between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia uh, begin to asphyxiate, and that is what's happening. As Richard Professor Wolf just said, uh, the special relationship doesn't look so special now. Mm. The Trump administration has punished Saudi Arabia uh, quite severely. Yeah. This is not just a token withdrawal, it's sending a big message to the world, uh, and the punishment is for flooding the market with oil, trying to destroy the shale oil and fracking oil uh, industry in the United States and severely damaging the interests of the U.S.-owned uh, multinational oil companies. So you might say Saudi Arabia was a trifle ungrateful uh, in doing that uh, because the United States uh, underwrites the very existence of Saudi Arabia. And President Trump was very blunt about that last year when he said publicly uh, that the Saudi royal uh, dictator Mm -hmm. would he didn't put it that way uh, wouldn't last two weeks uh, without the American underwriting and uh, that was brutal but true uh, so I don't think Iran has set this up but Iran is clearly a beneficiary of it mm. uh, I have to just add this caveat though Rick there's still plenty of US hardware in the Persian Gulf uh, the biggest US military base in the whole world is next door to Saudi Arabia in yep. Qatar and as we've discussed before, uh, the Persian Gulf is chock-a-block with American naval hardware. Professor, let me ask you, economically speaking, let's look at the long-range picture here. I imagine the Saudis are saying, eventually this whole thing's going to be over, everyone's going to want our oil again, and we're going to be top dog. Are they smart, or are they right or wrong if they're thinking that way? Well, I think that they're probably carefully weighing the pros and cons of what might happen since none of us really knows. Let me add another caution. Mm -hmm. Cutting production by a million barrels is not going to bring the price of oil up because the problem is much bigger than that. There would have to be much larger cuts both in Saudi Arabia and in the other oil producing countries who are not at all in a position to do that, uh, not Russia, not Nigeria, and so on. So I think you're going to see more maneuvering as each side tries to give up the least in order to get the most, and Saudi Arabia is gonna have to do more cutting than we're seeing now if that's gonna be the way to fix this problem, and they are going to resist because it's shaking up their own society. Is it really? Professor uh, Wolf and uh, George Galloway, my uh, thanks to uh, both of these gentlemen for their input.